All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. Let's uh, stand and do the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Okay, well, uh, here we are. Today is uh, April 13th at uh, 101 p.m. And we'll call this meeting to order. Um, we have members present, uh, Trimby. Uh, we have uh, Mark and... Uh, on, on the uh, virtual, we have uh, Mr. Holtzinger, and that makes four of us for a quorum. Uh, Jazz will not be joining us today, and uh, we're like two other members. So a small group of people, we got to make all the decisions. <laughs> Nobody can blame us, okay? Or just say, hey, we did the best we can. So, um, so with that, um, do you have any uh, amendments to the agenda, Dave? None from staff. Okay. Okay, well, let's do our first action item, the approval of meeting minutes on February 1st, 2022. Look for a motion. Motion accept. Second. Second. And second in Trinity. All those uh, in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Don't hear anybody opposed, so minutes are approved. All right, uh, board member reports. Uh, well, let's start with, hey, let's start with Ken Holtzinger. <laughs> let's bring him into good, the meeting. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, nothing to report to Kent, this no, month. We're on to get this to oh, <laughs> Kent, we're uh, working on your volume there. So uh, hang by. We'll go ahead and start with, uh, how about Trimby? Yeah, I can start. So for pilot organizations, I'll start with uh, Colorado Pilots Association. Uh, let's see, they are going to be heading to a museum at Meadow Lake Airport in the month of April as an event. Um, their fly-in in North Dakota is sold out. They got a bunch of Colorado pilots flying in. It's sold out completely. <clears throat> they have a meeting on Monday the 18th, and it's about non-towered airport safety. <coughs> so um, I'm going to try to be on that call, um, as many of us might try to also be on that, um, to talk about non-towered uh, airport safety and um, especially towers that have a lot of transient uh, cross-country flyers flying into them, um, the safety of getting into the traffic pattern properly and making radio calls properly. Um, so that would be a great thing on Monday the 18th. Uh, <clears throat> Colorado Pilot Association can go to their website and find out information on all these uh, organizations that I'm gonna talk about. Well, let's see. We'll talk about uh, Wings Over the Rockies has their first fly-in Saturday, April 30th. It's called First Saturday. It's a breakfast fly-in. Um, going on to Colorado, uh, let's talk about CABA. Um, they <clears throat> are having a social on April 27th at Flight Co. And they have their golf tournament. It's their 15th annual golf tournament on June 16th. That's for Aviation Business Association. Um, let's see. I believe they have a scholarship coming up soon too. Um, yeah, Colorado Pilots Association also is having a social on the 20th. So Flight Co is gonna be busy this month. Uh, the 99s and the Women in Aviation International just did a joint social at Flight Co. Uh, CPA is the 20th and CABA is the 27th. Um, so that's pretty fun. Um, those socials. Uh, let's see, talking about Women in Aviation International, the Mile High chapter, uh, a bunch of them attended conference recently. Um, they are also going to have a United Airlines, uh, ex-United Airlines recruiter who now works for Avalo, which flies out of Fort Collins now. Um, a recruiter is going to be their speaker in a couple weeks. Um, they also have a scholarship, which I think is due May 15th, four scholarships. Um, Colorado 99s has scholarships coming up. They also have an air marking at Fort Morgan Airport. <clears throat> Excuse me, that air marking is set for uh, May 14th at Fort Morgan. Colorado 99s just had a Pilatus tour at Rocky Mountain Metro Airport where they toured Pilatus. <clears throat> Moving on to 
Um, I think I got uh, nothing from Angel West, but they do have a race that's coming up in October. They're looking for pilots to provide airplanes to give rides to pilots uh, after their race. I think it's at Rocky Mountain Metro. Is that right? Does anybody know Angel Flight West <coughs> race out of Rocky Mountain Metro? Anyway, so that I'll have more details for that later. I don't have a report for Colorado's branches of Civil Air Patrol. Um, I reached out to Gary, didn't hear from him yet. And then for a commemorative Air Force, uh, we got some planes coming in. The B-29 dock is going to be at Centennial Airport, nice. May 6th through 8th. <clears throat> Excuse me, let me just have a sip of this water. <laughs> B-29 dock, uh, let's see, that's not a commemorative Air Force plane, but it's still an important aircraft. Centennial, uh, May 6th through 8th, the B-17 Sentimental Journey and the B-25 Made in the Shade will be at Rocky Mountain Metro May 29th through June 4th. Uh, the Sonoran Beauty, otherwise known as SNB-5, <laughs> um, is gonna be in Logan, Utah, June 9th through 12th. Um, the, oh, the World War II Ball is going to be at Boulder. I'm pretty sure those tickets are sold out by now. <clears throat> they, they sell out pretty quickly. But that, that really fun World War II Ball and air shows at Boulder. June 18th, and then there's a Warbird um, flying, uh, Warbird flying at Centennial July 9th. Hmm. Oh, okay, and then the Texas Raiders will be at Centennial September 26th through the 30th. And I believe I've touched on all of the pilot organizations that I could get a hold of for today. Well, excellent. Okay. Thank you, Trimby. Okay, thank you. Mr. Van Tyne. Thank you. Um, in the February meeting, I mentioned to everyone that uh, uh, the opening of scholarship applications for Wings Order Rocky Captain Jefferson Foundation, and that's a reminder everybody that's um, flying scholarship sponsored by the Ray Foundation of $10,000 a piece. Um, the uh, foundation received 63 qualified um, Applicants, I, said, I think one of the things I mentioned is we were um, hoping to get more applicants from outside um, the Denver Front Range metro area, and um, we, we indeed did. Um, can't, we're still looking for some west, uh, you know, west, uh, western slope applicants next year, but uh, uh, there's 20 scholarships that will be awarded, and that um, process will happen at, uh, uh, this month and through the end of May. So thank you for passing the word and uh, it's amazing the quality of young people that are applying for these, these uh, scholarships get their private pilot's license. Um, second, just on a general basis, and I think everybody is, is aware that uh, Steve Dixon is, um, has left the FAA as the administrator. There is a lot of uh, <coughs> lot going on and there's gonna be some pr pretty significant uh, uh, changes in the senior leadership within the FAA. It's something for all of us to keep in, keep in mm. our eyes on because it, it impacts us greatly. It's um, a little disappointing to see Steve leave because uh, I've known Steve for many years, so it's a little bit of a biased comment, but I think he, he brought some civility and, <clears throat> and dignity to the position. So uh, looking forward to find out who the next um, administrator will be. And then finally, in February in Washington, D.C., um, um, at the uh, General Aviation Manufacturer Association State of the Industry, uh, which is represented by you know, many of the other uh, 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 organizations, uh, aviation organizations, they announced the formation of uh, the EGLE initiative. And EGLE stands for Eliminate Aviation Gasoline Lead Emissions. Um, and so that formation of an organized group that involves uh, many of the uh, organizations that you're familiar with, AOPA, uh, EAA, uh, AAAE, and so on, really is focused on how does the industry get, um, uh, find an alternative, uh, unleaded alternative to uh, 100 low lead. Uh, their goal is to have that done by 2030. Uh, I'll say some, a couple more words about that later, but, uh, but again, having that, organization or having all the associations form 
um, and come together as a pool of money is going to be uh, important for us as, uh, as we go forward. Of course, this, this initiative also bears a lot of impact on Colorado and Colorado aviation. So something to pay attention to. Excellent. That's my report, Mr. Chairman. All right. Excellent. Okay. Kent, are you with Yes. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me now? Good afternoon. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, wonderful. Okay. Um, Mark, thanks for mentioning the uh, WINGS scholarship program. Um, uh, we'll, we'll definitely see if we can help uh, with West Slope interest in that. Um, it, if you've got a little snippet, maybe you could email me. Um, happy to help spread the word. That's just a, a wonderful opportunity. Um, continue to be just amazed and impressed at the activity and uh, the, the happenings at West Slope airports, new plans relative to terminal expansions, uh, Montrose, uh, Grand Junction, uh, the activity level is, is just really impressive and admirable. Um, on an FAA note, uh, uh, Mark, as, as you mentioned, the administrator leaving, um, in prior months, I had to <clears throat> get ready for a, my uh, flight review. And being an experimental aircraft owner, I was intimidated by the ruling that's cast such a cloud over the use of uh, experimental aircraft or warbirds in training and um, was absolutely amazed when I applied for a letter of deviation authority from the FAA or LODA. Um, I had it signed and returned on the very same day. Uh, it was just really impressive. <clears throat> um, other than that, uh, not, nothing more to report. And thank you all. Sorry, I can't be with you personally today. Well, thanks, Ken. That's excellent. And uh, yes. kind of tap, tap, tap into tap that. Into that. We had uh, um, what Ken was talking about is, yeah, business has been very good on the Western Slope. All the resort airports are really uh, rapidly have returned to uh, pretty much pre-COVID uh, levels um, in terms of number of employments for the airlines. Um, you know, the Southwest into Hayden and Montrose has definitely translated into record employments um, that they're experiencing. So, uh, 2021 has been a great year, and um, and we're starting to see some of those results. And it doesn't seem to uh, be slowing down whatsoever. Uh, at our our little airport, I think what really amazes me is uh, fuel prices are dramatically higher across the board, and certainly the operators are starting to really feel that pinch. Um, but um, at least in our world, it doesn't seem to be holding back because our volumes are still uh, exceeding even last year's and last year was a fantastic year for uh, us at our uh, airport. So um, the other thing that I did, and this isn't Western Slope related, but I did have the opportunity to uh, go to um, with the director to uh, Fort Collins um, to an event to celebrate the uh, bus. Um, what, what do they call that? I'm sorry. Hey, the landline, landline yeah, the landline service and met the operator, uh, the uh, the company and uh, very impressive. And it's just really amazing how um, Jason and and working with um, United Airlines and landline uh, and, and you got to tour the coach. And I mean, absolutely. You get in that that coach and it's like first class. It's amazing. And then it's just disappointing you get to get on a airplane and <laughs> smaller seats or whatever. But anyway, it is amazing. <laughs> but uh, but it's, it's, it's truly first class all the way for Fort Collins. And they're actually working to even um, where they're going to eventually, it's exciting, they're gonna eventually be able to do their screening, the TSA screening uh, in the, at, at the airport, at, at uh, Northern Colorado Regional Airport. And then they'll be able to seamlessly go to the uh, terminal, um, and uh, get on their flight on United Airlines. So it's it's really fantastic to see how Den and United Airlines and uh, Fort Collins, uh, or sorry, um, Northern Colorado Regional Airport is working together. So it's very exciting. So, um, but that's 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 all that's really going on. Business is good, and uh, 
everybody's just kind of hanging on and hoping that uh, fuel prices start to level off a little bit because that does start to affect uh, a lot of things as we're all seeing when we go to the grocery store. So, um, so the next item would be public comments. We have a few guests today. Would anybody like to have anything they'd like to share or update us on? No, I mean, Jeff, you made it three months. So that's amazing. So <laughs> say a couple words. Sure. Uh, we're, we're about to move forward with our taxiway lighting and uh, rehab projects. So we're gonna add taxiway lighting to a whole airfield. Um, long time coming for especially an airport of, of this size out here. And then we're also putting in a full perimeter fence and access control system um, coming in and the, the county uh, is gonna chip in about six to 7 million to complete that. So we're very excited about that. And then again, I'm Jeff Kowalska, new director out here at the Colorado Air and Space Port. Um, previously came from uh, Meacham Airport down in Fort Worth, Texas. I managed that airport for about eight years. Um, you know, uh, second busiest airport in the South Central region for 400 corporate jets or you know, 400 based aircraft, a lot of the corporate jets, a lot of oil and gas money down there. So, um, but uh, no, I'm just excited to do, uh, to be up here and uh, back in the, the Colorado aviation community. So I look forward to meeting and talking with everybody, uh, including those on the board. So excellent. It. Well, welcome and uh, great to have you on board. So. Okay, or anybody else like anything? Have anything? Yes. Todd. So Mike Ronfell with Centennial and CAOA update. Okay. Hi, hey, uh, everybody can hear me well. Can you guys hear me on your end? Hi, Mike. Yeah, we got you, Mike. Okay, great. Uh, just wanted to give a couple updates. Uh, I saw uh, Mr. Elaine yesterday and he asked me to give an update on Centennial Airport. Uh, and then I'll also give an update if we can on uh, uh, Colorado Airport Operators Association. So uh, on Centennial Airport, uh, just uh, kind of to give you guys an update, we've, we've been extremely busy over the last uh, couple of years. Uh, 2021, our fuel sales uh, were 16.8 million gallons, uh, which was a 37% increase from 2020. Uh, and which obviously was COVID year, but it, it was al also a 25% increase from uh, 2019 fuel figures. Um, for 2022, so far this year, in the first three months, we're tracking 21% ahead of where we were last year. Last year was our record all-time highest year ever uh, for fuel sales. Uh, so that's, that's really positive. Uh, a lot of uh, fractional activity and a lot of uh, or, um, commercial, or not commercial, but uh, flight departments, uh, activity as well as uh, charter services out here. So development wise, we're also kind of going gangbusters. We currently have six hangars that are under construction. Uh, after they're completed, that'll uh, uh, increase our, our hangar capacity here by about 118,000 square feet. Um, and then we'll have additional office space of up to 68,000 square feet. So um, we have literally three of those six hangars are, are currently uh, vertical right now uh, and being constructed. Uh, also in June, uh, the, the remaining three will go vertical, and then we'll have a uh, groundbreaking for uh, Sky Harbor development. And Sky Harbor development is coming in and planning to develop 18 additional hangars ranging in size from 10,000 square feet up to 26,000 square feet. And, and it's in two phases. And once uh, that's fully built out, that'll be an additional 235,000 square feet of hangar space. So. Uh, just a tremendous amount of demand out here for development and and and, and we've seen a lot of uh, increase in our jet traffic um, our operational numbers are, are down slightly uh, year over year but uh, but our fuel sales continue to climb uh, each, each year as we move forward so uh, that's really positive um, we also are obviously a recipient of the bipartisan infrastructure legislation funds uh, and so we did put in a request to, to construct a new tower out here at centennial airport um, we, we, we don't have a shovel ready project yet, but uh, we started our site uh, siting survey and we plan to put an RFQ for an architecture and engineering firm out in about a month with the hopes to uh, by next year have a shovel ready project and hopefully be able to uh, apply for, for grant funds to help pay for that, that new tower. Um, uh, on the uh, update on CAOA, uh, the airport, as you know, uh, June, uh, coming up in on June 8th through the 10th will be our spring conference. And of course, the, we'll have the cab meeting there. So we look forward to 
to having you guys uh, be at our conference with us and, and look forward to seeing everybody in person. Um, also, July 19th, 20th, 20th and 21st, uh, we are putting on a um, airfield marking uh, certification program down at the Colorado Springs Airport. Uh, so that's uh, filled up uh, quickly. So if there's any interest in the airport uh, community to have their uh, staff certified and, and trained on airfield marking, then, then uh, certainly go to our website and look that up. Uh, we've also been promoting a lot of uh, legislative efforts. We've been working with uh, the Hayden Airport and some of the non-towers in the state. There's been a big uh, uptick in uh, aircraft that have been uh, not notifying over the frequency when they're taking an active runway, and there's been uh, some concern that there's been some near misses. Um, and so we've been working with the, them to uh, kind of send a letter to the FAA to, to emphasize some of our concerns, and hopefully they can they can work towards some solutions. Um, also, we've been working uh, with the uh, Colorado Aviation Business Association on uh, uh, legislation that deals with laser strikes to aircraft. Uh, that, I know that that's intended we'll be seeing a big uptick in laser strikes, especially when it comes to uh, life flight operations out here. So, so that's uh, another piece of legislation, 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 easy for me to say, uh, we've been working on from CAOA standpoint. Uh, we also uh, are uh, recognize that there is a open position on the board uh, with um, uh, that we CAO typically makes a selection for. We have uh, someone selected. I don't know if it's too early to to mention their name, but uh, we we think we have a really good fit for that role. Uh, uh, we just need to put in our request uh, to the governor's office to to uh, see if we can get that individual on your board uh, um, here soon. So. With that, I'm I'll happy to open up uh, to any questions you might have for on Centennial Airport or uh, COA. Any questions? Well, it seems it like it's real boring out there at Centennial, so hang in there, Mike. Yeah, yeah, six months into the job, and you know I haven't burned down the place yet, but but uh, we're still very busy. Well, congratulations. That sounds great. Nice work. Thank you. And thank you for uh, the work. Uh, with the uh, uh, new position for the uh, board. So, so thank you. Okay, uh, anyone else? Is there anybody else anybody? that's online that like to have any comments, Sean? 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 Okay. Okay, well with that, we'll go on to our next item and let's talk about the uh, director's report. Director Elaine. Thanks Mr. Chair, I appreciate it. Uh, the first thing I'll point out is that we all had a conversation today as we're getting set up for the meeting. Uh, by the next time we have a meeting in this room, we will have a more permanent and better solution for Zoom meetings than the temporary setup that we're using here. That is the one we take on the road. So we're gonna make some investments in this room so that Zoom works a little better. Uh, even though we're back to in-person meetings, we're gonna continue to use Zoom to allow everybody statewide to participate and follow what we do and so we'll come up with a more permanent solution for all of this that works better uh, in this room uh, going forward so apologies for kind of the weird setup with the feedback and all that changes every time we think we haven't figured out something else happens at a different meeting it just doesn't work right so we'll get that uh, we we'll that squared away. Um, the first thing I'll point out, uh, Mr. Chair, is you acknowledged we do have two vacancies in the aeronautical board at this point in time. I think many of you remember Chick Myers, who was one of our Eastern Plains representatives. He had actually just been reappointed by the governor in December and unfortunately in late February passed away after a very brief uh, illness. So we, um, Chick was just a fantastic guy. Those of us that knew him were very fortunate to do so. He was a decorated army uh, aviator in Vietnam, had some amazing stories to tell about his time as a forward air controller flying bird dogs, uh, low and slow over Vietnam. Um, just a fantastic guy. We're really saddened that he's not able to be on the board anymore. So. We uh, have been working with the governor's office to uh, solicit applicants from the Eastern Plains, which is typically the front range east. Uh, they've got some great candidates in their queue to look at. So uh, they'll be appointing that person here very quickly uh, too. And then uh, you also notice George Merritt's not here. Uh, George was the senior VP of strategic ops at DEN and filled the position that Mike just talked about representing the uh, statewide association of airport managers is what it says in, in statute. Uh, George took a job in private sector effective April 1st, so that no longer qualified him to be 
on the board. So um, although CAOA doesn't pick that position, the governor's office does consolidate or consolidate coordinate rather with Mike and his group to help pick that position. They do have some uh, candidates. Uh, and again, I expect in the next two to three weeks, we'll see the governor make an appointment for both of those two positions. So hopefully we'll be back to uh, full cadre of the board by uh, June of uh, uh, first part of June for CAOA. So excellent an update on that. Uh, a couple other things going on. Um, Hetty uh, Carlson, I think you've all met Hetty. Uh, she joined our team back in January, our new education grants uh, and outreach specialist. Um, with your all approval uh, uh, last year of funding for FY22 and 23 grant program for education, $400,000 between the two years. Um, we're off and running with that. We disseminated the initial uh, announcement for the applications on March 8th. On March 23rd, Hetty hosted an awesome webinar for people that were interested in applying to learn a little bit more about the details and ask questions. We had 13 people on that call, so thank you for doing that. That was really cool. And uh, applications are due May 1st, so in a couple of weeks here, and we're really looking forward, our team uh, internally over the month of May, and vetting those, presenting those to all of you at the meeting in June for your review and input. Uh, and then our plan would be to have all of you actually formally adopt those uh, grant applications and approve those in uh, at our July, August meeting. Uh, so that's kind of the time frame that's been laid out there. So we're looking very forward to getting that money out the door and doing some very cool stuff. So thanks, Hedy, for getting all that going. It's fantastic. Yeah, congratulations, Hedy. Cool. I, I think the time could be better. Yeah, we need this. Yeah, it's been a long time. That's really cool. So thank you for your support of that program. We're excited to see what we get uh, this time around. Uh, just a couple of other things. Uh, on April 25th, Governor Polis and Congressman Goose, uh, who's uh, Colorado's <coughs> second district, uh, Northern Colorado, uh, they both attended an aviation workforce development presentation up at uh, Northern Colorado Regional Airport. Uh, it was hosted by Ames Community College, so it was really cool. They're very interested in aviation workforce development, and of course, Ames has some really cool things going on up there with um, their, of course, their aviation program. They're also looking to expand into air traffic control. And we're talking with them about ways we might partner with FAA, our project up there with the remote tower and AIMS to weave those two together and have them actually use that facility as part of their training program. So uh, really cool to make that pitch to the governor uh, and the congressman. And then, of course, uh, consummate pitchman Jason Lagone was uh, very good at uh, giving both of them an update on their new terminal project that's scheduled to break around next year and all the other cool things going on uh, at that airport. So it's really cool to see the, the governor along with the congressman. Um, uh, just a couple other things. Uh, from May 9th to the 11th, Caitlin Hetty and I are actually attending the Utah State Aeronautics Conference over in Provo. Um, of course, you all know, since our 2018 strategic plan, we've been talking about trying to host a statewide conference like that here in Colorado. CAOA does a great conference. CPA does a great uh, get together. CABA does their thing. It'd be really cool to do what some other states do and get all the aviation folks in the same room, pilots, mechanics, controllers, uh, aviators, balloon pilots, pilots that are uh, private pilots, professional pilots. So uh, we're going to go see how that works. That's the first time they've ever done that in Utah. So we're going to hang out with my counterpart, Jared Esselman over there and see how they did it to learn their uh, tips and tricks. They've got over 600 people registered from all across the state, so great sponsorships that we're anxious to, to build on what they're doing there. Um, back in February, Hetty and Caitlin actually attended the Montana Aviation Conference in uh, Missoula, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, learned a little bit about that, got embedded with the Montana team because their aeronautics division hosts that. So with that, we're gonna work really hard over the rest of this year to work with those associations and try to map out a way that we might put that here and how the logistics might work and how all those things might happen. So we're excited to maybe be the catalyst for a conference like that here in Colorado. What's, What's the venue for the Cheyenne or for the Wyoming? Uh, Wyoming uh, for the Utah? Or Utah conference? I would have to look. I don't know. Is it Salt Lake probably? The Marriott? Marriott. Marriott and Provo. Yeah, that's okay. when you have that kind of number. That's something to keep it's in mind. It's a big group and that's one of the things we're going to have to talk about. <clears> what's your target? What's the, what's the goal as far as when you would like to kick this off? for? This we year? are thinking in 2024. Okay. The first one, Good. so that would give us a year. Yes, ma'am. Women in Aviation International is considering having their conference at the Gaylord. Oh, so that. In two or three, <clears throat> two or three years. Awesome. And yeah. I know the 99s have reached out uh, on the Colorado Pilots Association. Uh, uh, Sue Osborne reached out and said they were interested. So 
as we look at it, we're kind of envisioning that this would be an every other year uh, event, not necessarily an annual event, because uh, it's a heavy lift it's and a lot of association yeah. leadership changes and all that. But uh, Caitlin and uh, and Hetty, they, they love doing this kind of stuff. So we're excited about seeing how we might do that here because we've already got a great aviation community. I think it's just another opportunity to kind of get everybody on the same page and go in the same direction even more than we already do. So uh, we're excited about that. Um, I don't know the Provo with all due respect, it's the most exciting and luxurious place to go, but <laughs> <laughs> it's not bad it's not it's okay it's okay it's not yeah anyway um well there's uh, no question with uh caitlin and Hetty, this is going to be yeah outstanding success so yeah so and i know caoa i've talked with mike they're excited about participating kava is as well it's just devils in the details so yep we're looking forward to that. excellent so, uh and then just the very last thing you'll see on uh, today's agenda down under program updates we're going to start including a new standing item called education and outreach update i'm going to turn that over to hetty and in every uh, meeting going forward she'll now brief you all on the outreach events that we're doing or planning on doing and kind of give you a summary of what we're doing out and about so <laughs> excellent exactly and then the last thing i want to talk about is you already see the uh the little screenshot up there um sean has been working on a fantastic video to summarize uh three airports that are highlighted as part of our economic impact uh you know we did that back in 2020 um, this is not about the study, but this is about kind of the real life story of the economic impacts of three different airports. Sean's been working on it for a long time. We appreciate it. This uh, video is 99.9% .9 done. What you will see does not have a trailer at the end. So we will have a little out uh, piece added to it with a summary and some more info. But Sean just did a, another great job. So Sean, if you want to play that or if there's anything you want to add uh, from your perspective, great work. And I'll just say, uh... We'll, we'll release that to the, the public, I guess. Um, it'll be on YouTube. That's where it'll live. And uh, we'll probably release that next week or the next amount of way. Okay. So, Excellent. Yeah. Good. Colorado is known for its majestic beauty, its wide open spaces, and places to play. But Colorado is also known for its dynamic system of 76 public use airports, each providing critical aviation services. We also operate the FBO and all the FBO operations. So we sell the fuel, provide all the pilot services. Specialized jobs. It provides a lot of quality jobs that are better paying for most small communities. And gateways for Colorado's visitors. More people are discovering Telluride and the Colorado mountains and they wanna come back. All of which greatly support and contribute to our local and state economies. People fly in through Colorado Springs Airport, then they stay at local hotels. They rent a car, they eat at our restaurants, they go to the shops downtown. So all that has you know, tremendous economic benefit, not just for the airport itself, but for the larger community too. Based on the findings of the 2020 Colorado Aviation Economic Impact Study, Colorado's airports support approximately 8% of our state's economy. Colorado airports provide nearly 346,000 jobs and generate more than $16.2 billion in payroll, $27 billion in value added, and nearly $49 billion in overall business revenue. Now, let's take a deeper look into the economic impacts of three Colorado airports, demonstrating how revenue streams can differ from one airport to another. The Colorado Springs Airport. 
the airport that seems to have it all. The airport has military and general aviation operations. We have the benefit of having our largest tenant, Peterson Air Force Base, right here on the airport. Commercial air service. We have five great carriers at Colorado Springs. And plenty of room for strategically planned, sustainable land development. The 900 acre business park that we call Peak Innovation Park. These elements working together help create a perfect storm of economic development. Economic development for the larger community, for the airport, at one of the largest and busiest premier commercial service airports in Colorado. With the capability to support a wide range of airport business activity, the Colorado Springs Airport was responsible for generating $3.4 billion in business revenues related to on-airport activity and visitor spending. These business revenues directly translate into not only jobs, but payroll as well. It's like a full city of people working there and they're working around the clock. So there's significant economic impact there as well. The Colorado Springs Airport can be linked to over 25,000 jobs and over $1.5 billion in annual payroll. And with the city's unique location, it attracts thousands of people from all reaches of the world, not only for business, but to experience Colorado's natural beauty. Tremendous scenery all around. We're close to the mountains. Colorado Springs, a more year-round airport, serving the business community as well as the tourism community in a city on the rise, Colorado Springs. Some may call this region of our state the other Colorado. Our airport is 67 nautical miles northeast of DIA, and we're kind of central to northeastern Colorado, 70 miles to Nebraska north and 70 miles to Nebraska going east. This airport is located snug against the western half of the Great Plains region in the small town of Akron, Colorado. And the airport's name says it all the Colorado Plains Regional Airport. The Colorado Plains Regional Airport doesn't necessarily attract droves of visitors in search of a Colorado Alpine adventure. We are not the resort town, we are not the playground, we are, we are a through port. This airport's well-maintained 7,000 foot long, 100 foot wide runway attracts aircraft owners from around the globe in search of a fuel stop as well as specialized aircraft maintenance and repair. We've established professional aviation companies here that, that do service a wide variety of different aircraft needs. Redline Aviation and Redline uh, Propeller are two companies that are very specialized in the propeller and propeller governor business. One of the six tenants conducting business at the airport is Hayes Aviation which provides fuel services as well as specialized airframe and aircraft painting services. These on-airport businesses help create over 100 local jobs that were linked to $5.4 million in annual payroll. It provides a lot of quality jobs that are drug tested, that are better paying for most small communities. The airport's tight network of tenants and businesses also help drive Akron's local economy, helping to produce over $15 million in overall annual business revenue. And realistic expectation to put smaller businesses at your airport that have a focus, that are specialized, they can be a, an important economic driver or benefit to just about any small community that has a well taken care of airport. 
I think we have an airport that a lot of communities um, of 100 or 200 or 300,000 people would be envious of. It's tucked high in the rugged Southwest Rocky Mountains of Colorado at an elevation just over 9,000 feet above sea level. Which makes us the highest uh, commercial service airport in North America. For many, the Telluride Regional Airport serves as the main gateway to this remote region of Colorado. Telluride is a world-class resort destination. The airport's commercial and private general aviation traffic fuels the local Telluride economy with visitors ready to enjoy all of its fine amenities. They're going to simply enjoy the alpine retreat that this is and enjoy the mountains and they're going to go skiing, they're going to go uh, enjoy the entertainment that we have to the restaurants and, and, and quite frankly the lodging. This type of air traffic requires fuel and specialized services. And this is exactly what the Telluride Regional Airport provides for the thousands who pass through the airport each year. So we sell the fuel, provide all the pilot services, and we have about, we do uh, just under 20,000 operations a year. Air traffic at the Telluride Airport is converted into business revenue for the airport and the surrounding Telluride community. So you have a total economic impact at Telluride Regional Airport of $51 million. And I think that's pretty impressive for, for the size of the small operation that we are, but how it really does impact and has really a benefit to one of being one of two airports that serve the Telluride uh, Resort. The airport generated nearly $52 million in business revenue related to on-airport activity and visitor spending. Business revenue equals jobs. A lot of transportation jobs. We have transportation companies, rental car companies. Um, we have concierge, hotels. The airport is associated with supporting 414 jobs. These jobs produced over $18 million in annual payroll. Because of our location, our destination, and our region, and the Colorado mountains, and they want to come back. Thanks, Sean. I really appreciate that. Great job. And as I mentioned, we'll uh, add a uh, little out trailer to that and we'll uh, get that out to you in the Mount Lake newsletter, which we're going to have out next week. So that's it. I'm the director's report and everything else from staff at this moment. So thanks, Sean. Nice work. Nice work. Okay. Uh, let's talk about the uh, financial update there, Mr. Shuck. Sure. So we were just looking at the economic impact. Now we're going to look at the day to day financials. So uh, March's revenue uh, came in at 3.7 million. Uh, bringing our total revenue to the year to 28.9 million. Uh, it's the beginning of Q4, so our quarterly forecast update. Uh, we are updating our revenue forecast to 42 million for FY22 here. Uh, the increase is obviously due to the rapid increase in fuel prices, as well as now record monthly fuel flow at Denver International Airport. Uh, neither of which was projected to be the levels they are when we last did this three months ago, but. Uh, as, as you know, that changes rapidly in this industry. So. Well, you can trust that with our revenue for FY21, because I remember that number was a lot less than that. I sure will. <laughs> so the total revenue for March came in at 2.7 million, uh, which was 101% of forecast, uh, which was almost 3.7. Uh, in comparison, that's 232.9% of the 1.6 million in March of 2020. So we are more than double uh, where we were a year ago. Uh, it's 116% of February 2022's revenue. Uh, and then for April, we're forecasting 4.1 million in revenue. Uh, again, just context for forecasting model. We flip back in January to go into our historical month over month fuel trends. We'll get to that slide later, but we are still using that model uh, as well. Uh, just 
Just updating there because that has bounced around through the COVID pandemic. We are on our own forecast model, uh, which short term, even through this fiscal year, uh, we're within three percent of our short term forecast. Long term is just where it gets hairier based on what's going on in the industry. So. Uh, next one is monthly cash balance. Uh, our 160 balance finished at uh, 17.4 million, uh, which was up 826,000 uh, from the February number of 16.6. Uh, our April month end forecast is at $17.8 million. Uh, again, the increase was expected. Fuel, level, fuel levels in Denver continue to pace expectations as this fuel prices. So. Next slide, tax disbursements by month. Uh, in March, we sent out 2.3 million in tax disbursements, 2 million of which was sales tax, 231,000 was the abjet excise yeah, uh, tax, and 9,000 was the abgas. Uh, again, they continue to follow month to month trends. There's nothing out of the ordinary on these. Next slide here. Uh, this will look a little different from the last time we did this. Uh, this is our contingency analysis. Um, as the board uh, approved in January, our update to the CA program for this year of $9 million. Uh, that shows on there. Um, but something to point out that even with our worst case forecast implemented 12 months from now, uh, our cash balance is exceptionally healthy, uh, even with a slightly enhanced number already showing in 2022. Uh, as the trends continue to show strong revenue, uh, we will be providing additional funding recommendations to the cap at our next meeting. Uh, as you can see here, our cash balance is way above our total cash dollars allocated. Uh, to put that in context, I know I've, the staff sitting here to say that. Two years ago, oil was at minus $40 a barrel. Now it's hit 120 in the last 60 days. So uh, you've all heard my rant on the of using well forecasting, but that's the, the method we have. So bottom line, we have an exceptionally healthy cash balance. Uh, we are working on discussions internally to bring recommendations to the board as to how we can spend some of that money in a fiscally responsible way that still aligns with our strategic plan. Uh, and then just again, for context, our worst case scenario uh, has Denver flowage at 35 million uh, gallons per month and oil at $40 a barrel. Well, they're already at 38 million uh, flows, and we're heading into the busy time. And as you know, oil prices are bouncing around 105 dollars per barrel race. So we are well above our work, worst case forecast, and, and that's where, as we project our continuous to balance, the cash balance is more than covered. Uh, our admin expenses uh, for the year uh, we are currently at 456,000 in expenditures. Um, with a projected total expenditure of 660000 that would put us at 3.9% of that Y21 revenue. So we're uh, well below the 5% cap that we're running into, and we won't have any, uh, any issues staying under that for the rest of this fiscal year. Next slide, as I mentioned, is the fuel flow at Denver. Typically, we try to keep this to a three year slide, but based on the last few years here, uh, we're keeping the fourth year. As you can see, that March number in yellow at Denver International uh, was 39.1 million gallons. That was a new March record for fuel flow at Denver. Uh, that's up 118% from February's 33.2 million gallons and up 152% from fuel flow uh, in March of 2021. The forecast for April is 38.1 million gallons. That would be an increase, obviously, of 152% of the 2021 number. However, as you note there, uh, the two blue lines, which are 2019 and 2021, they start to get back to that normal trend. The monthly fuel flow in a normal environment is remarkably consistent. What month is up, what month is down? I would not be surprised to see the forecast, the actual revenue coming a little bit higher than forecast because we typically do see an increase in April for March numbers, but we shall see how that goes. And as you see, we're heading into the Busy time of year for fuel flow in Denver, and if we continue to set records, uh, so will our revenue. And real quick before Bryce goes on, I think you've all seen the news that in calendar year 21, Denver was the third busiest airport, not just mm -hmm. in the U.S., but the third busiest airport in the world. 
typically pre-COVID, they ran about 18, 19 busiest in the world and fifth, sixth busiest in the U.S. So I think it's just been remarkable to see what's happening at that airport, which of course we're inextricably tied to their success. So uh, just incredible to see what's going on over at Denton. Thank you. And then the final slide, just a breakdown of our expenditures for the division of March. Uh, of the 2.6 million with expenditures, 2.3 million were tax disbursements. Uh, we had statewide initiative payments of 144,000. CDAG disbursements total 154,000. As we hit into the construction season and our fiscal year end, the CDAG chunk will start taking a little more than the statewide initiatives, uh, typically, but nothing nothing out of the ordinary here. Um, tax, tax disbursements will always be our, our biggest piece of the pie, so to speak. So that's, uh, that's the financial update. I am happy to answer any questions that one might have. Board members, questions? Good report. Nice report. Sure. I would. I'm sorry. I would just reiterate to Bryce's point. Um, we need to rationalize our cash balance. It's a little too high, uh, mm -hmm. but we're going to be very thoughtful about that. So again, in June, we'll come back to the board uh, with uh, some uh, thoughts and recommendations for you all to consider about what we do. Uh, it could be everything from so we've talked about funding some lower priority items in our CFP, maybe some new or expanded statewide initiatives. But we really want to take advantage of our current opportunity to make do some cool things that we can do this year. Uh, and of course, we'll do that in a way that's consistent with maintaining a reasonable cash balance and good reserves uh, and not go too over the top. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's a great strategy. And um, yeah, I think those are quite a contrast to discussions in the past. So I think those will be <laughs> some fun discussions. I, think that's I gotta tell you again, I will, you know, kudos to, to Todd and the planning team. They're, <clears throat> yeah. they're really seasoned. They know their airports. They've got some great ideas that we're excited to come talk to you about and things we can do to really move the needle at a lot of our airports. So uh, stay yep. tuned. We've got some cool stuff that they're working on that uh, it's just awesome. That's great. Excellent. Nice work. Nice work, the entire team. So that's fantastic. Okay. Um, then we have our. Uh, I've got the next one here. Sure. Tax disbursement. Okay. Yeah. Go so ahead. this is just informational uh, only. Uh, the tax disbursement cost center uh, is where the disbursements for excise and sales tax allocated to uh, in our budget structure. Since the done of statutory requirements year over year, we often have money roll over into those. However, uh, with the unprecedented increase in our revenue this fiscal year, uh, the budget room in this cost center has been depleted. Uh, it was scheduled for it to be running out here uh, next month. Uh, but working with our counterparts at CDOT and the budget team there, which uh, Katie Carlson is here today, uh, she's kind of my go to resource there. Uh, we did increase that cost center allocation by $7 million uh, to a total of $29.6 million. It's just information we don't have to move that from any of our line items because as we know roughly two-thirds of the money we bring in immediately goes out the door tax disbursement so it's just keeping up with the revenues but when your revenues go from 20 million to a forecast of 42 the next year uh that isn't within the budget structure so that money has just been moved uh which can be just information to the tc as well as that does that line item as well uh, just letting you know that that had happened uh because we were going to get a budget room because Again, 20 million to 42 million in revenue makes a big difference. So we will not run into any issue there. Uh, we have that covered. We, we try to do things ahead of time so uh, we don't run into the pinch where we're having a struggle. So that has been completed. Just information for you guys. Well, I'm sure those are easy discussions <laughs> for approval, right? <laughs> Great. All right. Thank you. Anything else? That's everything for me. All right. Excellent. Well, let's go on to uh, item number eight. This, this is these are uh, action item items. Uh, let's talk, go into our 2022 uh, Colorado Discretionary Aviation Grant Federal Match Grant Funding Hearing. Thank and you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, the right? board. So again, all good news coming out of the business office with the Division of Aeronautics. And so uh, what I'm happy to present here is uh, trying to spend down some of that cash balance. So uh, April is our normal month for our Federal Match Grant hearings. Um, again, how that mainly works is airports, our federal airports, receive AIP funding, and that AIP funding requires a local match con uh, contribution. And so historically, what we've done is we'll help cut that local match in half. So it's usually 10%, so we'll cut that normally in half to 5%, so it turns into a 90% federal, 5% state, 5% local project. Um, we do cap that, pro that program at $250,000 per airport uh, per fiscal year. 
And so that's our normal April meeting where we just uh, we collect all of those uh, grant applications over the last few months uh, for the, the AIP program. And so with that program alone, there was uh, just over 70 or we're planning for just over $74 million in federal funding. And then our associated match along with that would be just over 2.5. So that program, honestly, we've been planning on for the past three to four years because that's how our normal capital improvement plan works, is we really know that's that program and what projects are coming up. But as you can see, the, this table has two different lines on it. So uh, a few months ago, as everyone knows, the uh, bipartisan infrastructure law uh, was put into place, which uh, added a lot more money to the country for aviation. And so we have just finished up capital improvement planning statewide uh, when that came out. And so we had to figure out how to do this. And so I will say uh, that second line specifically, the amount of work the planning team and our office put together. Um, so we, uh, the FAA hosted a, uh, an online seminar of what to expect for the bill funding on, I believe it was February 15th where invited the, all actually all three states were invited to it, letting them know what the expectations were for this money. And what this actually accounts for, uh, this three different pots of money, I'll talk about one at this point, it's called bill allocation. So somewhat similar to the entitlement program, but each of the uh, airports, uh, the federal airports, um, get a chunk of money every year for the next five years. And uh, in Colorado, that totals $27 million, not counting Denver International. So when you count in Denver International, that number goes up to $86 million a year from 22 through 2026. And so we had just figured out a great plan with all this AIP funding. And now we're throwing another $27 million in per year over that time period. And so the planners worked with all of their airports to get their, their bill CIPs updated. And so again, for the past two months, uh, that's what we've been working diligently on. And so we've accounted for $134 million in additional projects over the next five years that we honestly had, were not planning on. And so we really had to kind of start that process, our, our grant process over for that. And because of how that money was announced, uh, these airports honestly weren't expecting this money to come down. And so they've not planned for the additional matching requirement as well. And so what uh, we kind of stepped up to and what we talked about at our last cap meeting was is that we will not cap that match on those bill funding. And so as you can see, um, I talked about a $27 million allocation. Um, a lot of the airports honestly weren't even really able to take that money this year or didn't have a project plan for that year, for this year. And so a lot of those airports carried over the money into future years, similar to entitlements. And so, um, so as you can see here, there we're planning about $10 million of federal funding for that, those bill funds. And that accounts for another half million dollars of state funding that we had not planned on doing. Um, but luckily, uh, we actually did increase the grant program from $8 million to $9 million uh, somewhat recently. And so what we are here today to request uh, for these federal matching projects is just over $3 million. So as you can see, it's $3,018,418 uh, uh, um, for our grant program this year. And that would bring our entire grant program, uh, including our local, our uh, state and local projects uh, back in January of 5.5. That brings our whole program up to $8.5 million. And so that leaves us about a half million dollar gap between uh, our eight and a half million and that $9 million that Bryce allowed us to spend. And so that'll allow us to kind of handle amendments as they come up over the year as well. So really what we are here to, to ask for today is approval of that $3 million. And what's kind of crazy about that, that is 30 different airports requesting funding from us this year, which uh, as you know, the last few years, we haven't had a whole lot because uh, all federal projects came in at 100% uh, the last two years. And so over the next few slides here, you'll see all 30 of those airports broken up on these slides and it was included in your board packet as well. But again, 30 airports, that's uh, the most grants I've seen go out for federal match in a long time. And these do include those bill projects as well. So um, one thing I will also reference is, so you saw $10 million of bill funding is planned this year, which means a lot is carried over into future years. So we're, we're about a half million dollars in match this year. 
we're planning it for about 1.9 million in match purely for those bill funded projects. And so at, that's as Dave was talking about, uh, we're finding a good home for a lot of these projects, especially as our cash balance is a little higher than we'd like it to see. There's plenty of need out there, and especially with this extra bill funding coming into the state, we have a good plan to go forward with it, which is really good. But um, here on the next slide, it'll kind of sum up all those funds again that we were looking for. So today, yeah, I am requesting approval of uh, $3,018,418 18, $18, in federal match uh, applications. And then along with that, uh, 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 approval of the grant res uh, the resolution 2022-03 uh, allocate those grants. Okay. Be happy to answer any questions you have. Sorry, any questions? very long-winded, but there was a lot of information. No, that's great. Any questions? Go ahead. So, Bob, uh, yes, sir. you had 30 airports. Is there 31, 32? I mean, you know, after the 30, are there other airports that have made requests and you capped it at the 30, or is that does that handle all the requests that you got? That encapsulates all of the requests that came through this year. So we are matching uh, almost all the federal money going out to all the airports this year. Um, on the AIP side, where I talked about, we have that $250,000 cap. Yeah. On a normal year, there's about six airports that run into that $250,000 cap. Um, because that, that cap allows us to do about $5 million projects, where it's $4.5 million federal, um, $250,000 state, $250,000 local. Those six or so airports, they're usually doing $10 million jobs. So like the Grand Junctions of the world, um, where they're in, in Colorado Springs. We run into that cap every year for that AIP funding. And again, it's pretty much the same airports each year. But it allows us, that $250,000 cap allows us to spread money around the state a little bit more for state and local projects too. Um, okay. So, and again, it's usually those large airports that are getting those extra large amounts of that uh, discretionary funding. And you spoke of having a half a million dollar budget for amendments. Yes. Yeah. How is that typically used? So, what are those amendments? What are I will say like? typical is a crazy word, especially today. Um, we've seen some bids start to come in a little bit higher than we were expecting. Again, just because where oil sits. I've talked about in past meetings where most of our money goes toward pavement maintenance, which means it ties a lot back to oil. And so um, we just have that, and I, I didn't want to spend it. I actually had some other projects that I, I would like to do, but it doesn't make sense to actually pull those forward. And I, I want to protect projects to make sure we're able to get some of those projects that maybe come in just a little bit high, yep. that we can help with those. But honestly, with some of the bids that come through this year, there may be projects that just don't happen in this volatile market and that we'll need to wait till future years. But this will at least give us a little bit of buffer to allow us to, to make sure projects can still happen this year and uh, to have the funding. So, okay. I think it, your goal is to make sure that you use that half a million dollars by the end of the year. Yeah, that is the hope. But again, if, if we don't, we'll carry that over and we have plenty of need next year as well. Okay. Go ahead, Scott. And I might just add a couple of clarification to Mark. Uh, those requests would be a supplemental request that would then have to come to the yeah. board for future expenditure. Okay, that's, that makes, I, I would expect that. But, you know, I mean, I think that's very prudent to hold that. Money. Yeah, especially right now. <laughs> One of the things we're watching very closely, uh, it's not just aeronautics, the amount of money that's coming into the aviation program pales in comparison to what's going to the highway and surface transportation side. Um, there's a lot of concern nationally among DOTs not just about aviation projects, but uh, contracting capacity, uh, whether there's even enough contractors to do all the work for all this money. Um, and what does that mean for your project if it's small? It's not a multi-billion dollar Central 70 reconstruction, and it's a, a small runway rehab or airfield lighting program. So we're we're starting to expect much higher bid costs. We're having internal discussions about the 250 cap and what do we do because we expect bid costs are going to come in as Todd talked about a lot higher than what we expect. What, what is, if I can ask, yeah. what is the, uh, you know, what is the history of the 250 cap? Was that something, and what, and has that been looked at? Recently? We have, we're always looking at it and thinking about the, the cap was uh, kind of the philosophy was that if you had a project that was over $5 million, you were most likely a larger airport that had the capacity to okay. do your local okay. match yourself. And as Todd talked about, that allowed us to reallocate that money to like the five and a half million dollars to state local projects for either airports that aren't federally eligible or projects that aren't federally eligible. But again, if, if that means you know, an airport, that, that, that's always discretionary. If an airport comes to us and says, look, I can't afford this, we are always willing to, to say, well, tell us why and we'll, we'll talk to the board. So, and a little bit of my line of questioning and thought 
is on the other end, yeah. which is I won't worry about the really small airports that have need that, you know, that at, they're competing at the bottom of the list, but they're competing and sometimes aren't uh, right. getting funding when they. Yeah, absolutely. And again, we do, we can handle those on a case by case basis because we are starting to get back to the point where we're going to be doing uh, runways, state and local, without federal money. And with our state and locals, that's 90% state and 10% local. Right. And yeah. so, yes, there are going to be some airports out there that that 10% is not going to be a possibility on their side. Yeah, right. And so that that will be on a case by case basis where we'll, we'll have a conversation with them or a conversation with you and kind of find the best way to move forward with that. And and just to clarify, this is the first round of AIP grants that will require matching because we've had that luxury over the last two years to not require local match. So to Mark's question, and I believe this is true, is there through, even through the worst of our uh, downturn and fiscal challenges, there has never been an airport that's had to turn away federal funding. So we've leveraged, always leveraged that federal money uh, to do great projects and even at the smallest airport. So the federal funds are there. It's always been a priority. Couldn't get your runway fog sealed or anything, but you could certainly get your, uh, you could certainly uh, get those those federal funds to your airport, which is fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I would say the one, the one thing that's separate <clears throat> for that $250,000 cap, that is purely for discretionary funding. Um, so each airport right. gets entitlements as well, kind of the larger airport you are, the more entitlements you get. We don't cap the entitlements on the match as well, because some airports will carry over their entitlements over the years, right. which some airports have enough entitlements that that'll go above that 4.5 million. And so we've told airports that no matter what, we will match your entitlements at a full half of that match. Okay. So um, the other piece we're trying to work on in the future, and this is a little bit separate from our conversation, is the rest of the bill. So yeah. we promised airports that for this year, 2022, we no matter what, we won't cap our match on the bill funding. And uh, that's some, that's going to be an internal conversation probably for our uh, October, I mean, our August workshop of how we should do that. Do we continue that on into those next four years as well, where we don't cap those funds? But again, that's something we'll have to have a further conversation on as well. I'm planning on a worst case scenario where we will match all of those. And again, 2023 is planned at $1.9 billion in match purely for matching to build funds, plus our two to two and a half million dollar match for AIP. So again, I'm tracking all of that separately just so we so we can have a better conversation and again, have a very good direction forward on those. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Okay, well, uh, let's do, uh, how about a motion to approve the 2022 federal match applications that totals $3,018,418 and the associated uh, resolution, which is 2022-03. Trim I yield the trim. Seconded? I'll second. All right. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Did Ken say yes? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> you do a thumbs up. <laughs> okay, that, that motion is uh, approved. Okay. Thank you very much. Nice job. And, and to uh, for everybody else benefit uh, the board packets that we received definitely details what all these federal funds and all the projects that you said 30? 30 airports. 30 airports. So that's that's fantastic. Yeah, we haven't seen that in a while. So yeah, it was a nice work. It was quite the lift. Is a little bit of, like were you a little busy there, Ty? It, it was not just me. Was, <laughs> the whole so staff, to, right? Especially yeah. with that bill funding, we had to compress and use yeah. a five month process yeah. down into two months for $134 million for the project. Yeah. So it was, uh, it's been fun. Um, I have a question, and this is not to make it more complicated or complex for you, but um, are you maybe starting next year, are you looking at doing something similar to what you're doing with the general aviation entitlement funds? So in other words, where there are other airports that might be able to use out years or whatever, or they could for, you know, forfeit their current year, let the, another airport like I did with my entitlements, right. I've been doing with my entitlements. So that was a very good question with the bill funding. And that was a question we had as well. Okay. The bill funding cannot be transferred. Okay. So yeah, that was a main question. I bet you were relieved when you heard that. <laughs> I, I can't say I was disappointed. So yeah. That's um, yeah. a little bit more straightforward, but yeah. it was uh, still amazing to try to allocate $27 million yeah. each year for the next stop. Yeah, I, I feel, feel sorry for the uh, FAA uh, ADO office of 
this unbelievable. Correct. And it's going to be complex. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Kind of rodeo, actually, okay. Well, excellent. So we have uh, you're, you're you're lined out. So um, this is good. And then and this is is this a 20, 22, 20, oh, 23, right? It's uh, oh, no, this is twenty twenty two. The resolution that covers. 2023 grants, correct? Into 2023. So, yeah, so the grants, okay. we, we will uh, get right. approval now, which makes them 2022 grants, but they will be used over the next gotcha. three ish years. And then everybody, yeah, and that's for everybody's benefit that uh, then, just like the federal grants, the airports have three years to, to utilize the funding or those grants. Correct. Yes, okay. Sir. All right. Or they get a phone call from Caitlin and, and you or something, right? So, okay. Yes, we're not shy. Very good. Okay, uh, with that, let's go to our uh, I, next item, uh, uh, professional development out of state travel plan. We have uh, two action items, one for fiscal year 2022, which is finishing up, I, I, I imagine, and then uh, fiscal year 2023. So take us there, director. Not nearly as exciting as all of that, <laughs> uh, that money you just spent a minute ago. But, uh, Important nonetheless, but uh, anyway, yes, uh, in this current fiscal year, uh, the board previously approved our out of state and staff professional development plan uh, that totaled $16,150. Since that time, um, a couple things have changed. We plan on going to the American Association of Airport Executives annual conference, but can't do that because CAOA is happening that week and can't be two places at once. So, as I mentioned earlier, on this year's plan, we're going to swap the attendance at the Utah Aeronautics Conference for that. Um, we just want to be completely transparent with the board on that, so we ask, ask for your blessing. That would see a revised FY22 plan a reduction of $1,450 over the new about $14,700. So we would ask for your blessing on the FY22 revised plan, totally $14,700. Okay. Uh, any questions? All right. Motion to uh, look for a motion to approve the updated fiscal year 2022 professional development and out of state travel plan totaling $14,700. So moved. And second. Seconded. Okay. Uh, uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Can't say aye. Okay. <laughs> and then, um, so let's hit uh, 2023. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And this would be the normal time of the year when we would bring to you our FY23 uh, professional development and out-of-state travel plan. The one that you have in front of you this year reflects what we would call a more normal year. This was what our pre-COVID numbers look like. That totals $25,900. $50. Um, the list of, uh, of proposed uh, opportunities, conferences, educational events are included in your packet. And so happy to answer any questions about all those. I'm sorry that it's such an eye chart if you print it, but if you zoom in on your PDF, you can read that. But uh, um, again, this, uh, I, I just I'd like to tie this back to our strategic plan. Uh, that was a huge part of our strategic plan. Uh, goal four specifically calls for staff development. This gives everybody on our team uh, an opportunity to go somewhere to learn, participate, speak. Um, and of course, that just uh, brings all that back to us and allow us to do an even better job uh, of running our division. So that's how this ties back into our 2021 strategic plan, Mr. Chair. And what's GFOA? Government Finance. Uh, oh, great. It's code for the Paris <laughs> Air Show. Yeah. <laughs> 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 okay. Uh, <laughs> any questions? No. Okay, so let's do a motion to approve the division's fiscal year 2023 professional development out of state travel plan totaling $25,950. So moved. Seconded? Second. Second. Wait and see if. Can't second it. Okay, good. And uh, discussion? Great. Uh, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any Aye. opposed? Thumbs up. Okay. Okay. So that takes care of uh, 2023. Let's do uh, program updates. Uh, Hetty? Yes. Tell, talk to us about education and outreach. I will. Thank you. Mr. <laughs> um, I just want to update on some of the events that the division has and will be attending this year. Um, starting in February, we went to the Rocky Top uh, Middle School event with uh, gifted, talented students, and they got to fly in the flight simulator and um, 
we had a nice presentation for them. Um, that was that was a really interesting and kind of fun event for us. <laughs> um, in March, we went to the Aerospace Day at the McNichols Event Center. I keep wanting to say yeah. Arena. Arena. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Dave and I went down to Falcon Aero Labs in. Um, that was uh, probably the last one. Yes, you're neck in the woods. <laughs> um, wow. Yeah, uh, that was great. Uh, Sean spoke at the 99 South Central section meeting uh, last month as well. Um, the end of this month, we're hoping to support the Glenwood Springs Young Eagles Day, which is Saturday the 30th. Also the same day as the wings fly in because they changed it because a dock coming in. Um, and then in June, um, we will be attending the flight training and aviation career symposium as well at WINGS. Um, we have also had a monthly presence at the WINGS Over the Rockies breakfast fly-ins, which has been really great um, just to kind of get out there in the pilot community and let them know who we are and, and why we're important and relevant to them. <laughs> um, and uh, we also are handing out old directories and charts to all of the um, young eagles for the uh, rallies that we have out at the Central Miller Park or Chapter 3. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah, it's great. Okay. And they love it. They absolutely love it. They get so excited when they see those charts. That's cool. Good. And also at the end of February, uh, we got approval to create our own Instagram page. Um, All right. As you can see up there, uh, our handle is CO Aero Division, and that's how you can find us if you are on Instagram. And if you're not um, on Instagram, I encourage you to uh, go ahead and make your own account. <laughs> and uh, we can go on there and share photos of everything that we're doing, news, events, um, just kind of getting the word out there. Very nice. Yeah. I like that logo too. All right. Anything else, Sadie? Nixon. All right. Let's go to the. Let's go to the next very important speaker, Mr. Uh, Bill Payne. Okay. Uh, well, talk about I'm the remote really, tower update. I'm really happy. I'm to sure you have lots of information for us. Okay. Here, so just uh, don't look at your watch here. Wasn't that was it, was it that solar? <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, after two years, we finally started our phase one testing. Yes. Phase B. Yes. We've gotten through the first two week period of testing. Pretty much what we're seeing is what we've always known. And that is that the controllers, the more they work on the system, the more, the more they get experienced with it and are able to, able to use it. Uh, we've had, uh, ton of FAA people in there. It was uh, the circo controllers were actually doing the talk alouds at each position. Talk aloud is where they sit there and say, well, I would have done this, I would have done that. And in each position, we had two uh, SM, uh, subject matter experts looking over their shoulders and, and recording all the data. Got some real good data. Uh, we're uh, Couple of hiccups, uh, but for the most part, I think I think the, the testing is going real well. Uh, we have uh, the next two week period begins next week, uh, and that's going to be fairly intense. Uh, we've got some some uh, folks coming in, a new set of SMEs to look at the program, uh, and hopefully we'll be able to. Get that all wrapped up. Mark has generously uh, uh, said he would fly for us uh, some of the uh, procedures. We're going to be doing some scenarios on Wednesday, the 20th. If for some reason that goes sideways, then we'll end up uh, doing it on Friday. But uh, we've got we've got three, uh, four volunteers, three in addition to Mark. Uh, Ames Community College has said they would fly, and uh, we have the hospital chief pilot that said she would fly. So we've got we've got enough folks to do it. Uh, as we all know, the winds have been really pretty miserable here lately. Uh, 
So what happens next is uh, after the, this next two week period, uh, we, uh, there'll be a, a report created, which is intended to be in support of the uh, SRMD safety risk management document. We have the SRMD safety risk management panel is scheduled for August. And I'm not uh, expecting any, any real issues, although uh, they've added a new person to the panel who I know very, very well. And uh, he and I have arm wrestled on numerous occasions on other panels. Good guy. Uh, he's, uh, I think he'll bring a lot to the program. The FAA is a little nervous about it. I don't know why, but he's a NAFTA representative. Also, uh, uh, on Friday, Sean and I are going to be up at FNL uh, doing some filming. We're, uh, we're going to use the FAA. I say we, I'm working with the, with the FAA's VISTA siting team to develop a, a, a AC for remote towers. And we're going to use FNL as the uh, validation site. Great. So uh, I've taken them up there. Uh, it's a combination of FAA personnel as well as MITRE. Uh, for everybody that knows, MITRE is an FNRDC federally funded uh, search and development uh, uh, unit. And, and uh, we're going to, what comes out of this will be the, the siting order for remote towers. And so Sean is pulling up tomorrow on Friday with me, or, and, and we're going to, what the plan is, is to uh, do a 360 degree uh, panoramic at each one of our, our, uh, our panel mast arrays. And then we'll go into the facility and Sean's going to do some, we're going to film some controllers in there looking like they're doing stuff. <laughs> well, the key thing looking like they're doing. Yeah, right. so we can't do doing it. like these, that's you know. <laughs> yeah. See you. That's right. That's right. So, <laughs> so, so, so a couple of things, a couple of things that I found real interesting is as you probably know, when when uh, when we wrote the requirements document for uh, our remote tower, we required radar. And that's uh, these tests just simply validate the fact that we need it. Now, some of the concerns that we have with FML in particular is the fact that it is very busy. It's, it's I'm yeah. having flown in there myself, and Mark does as well. I, I can attest to the fact that it is busier than one legged man in a butt kicking contest. <laughs> it's, just, it's just really, I mean, there's a lot going on. And uh, you've got a lot of touch and go traffic. You have transient people in there uh, that, are, that are flying the instrument approaches. So it gets, it gets uh, a little bit complicated. Uh, the FAA is a little nervous about that. They say, well, we, this may be too busy an airport. My, my position on that is sit down and shut up. Yeah. The, the, uh, you want to you want to be able to you know stretch yourself on this. Mm -hmm. So that's like I said, uh, that's all good news stuff, bad news stuff. We're forecasting it taking six months to get signatures after the SRMG is safety risk management document. Now. Okay. I have an ongoing battle with the folks at the FAA on this. There's no reason once it has gone through the SRMP process and has been signed off by all the lines of businesses and everybody on the panel, that it should not just be the risk acceptors signing. And I, I said, take the document, walk over to the office, knock on the door, or just barge in and say, sign this. It took them. It took them almost a year to do the one at JY at Leesburg. Wow. So it is. This is. 
bureaucracy at its finest. Uh, we've got a good team. We've got some good folks in the FAA. But once it gets up to some of the higher levels, I, I will tell you that Mark alluded to it. Uh, the upper level the folks on the 10th floor at FAA, uh, they're they're all all but jumping out of the window. I mean, they're leaving right and left. This is in DC. It's going to be a lot of lot of uh, yeah the shifting the chairs, chairs and yeah new chairs executives. and I mean the the uh, next gen uh, administrator she left and of course Terry Bristol CEO left uh, Steve Dixon left and then a good friend of mine took a position with NBA Double A uh, Chris Ruscio who uh, he's he's a great guy I mean he's not. Do you know him more? No, I don't. I'm gonna tell you, he is he is a first rate guy. Um, and he he left. So it's gonna be a different different set of circumstances. So you have a whole new cast of characters you get to educate. It is good job, it, Bill. It, well we know news, we believe in you. The good news is <laughs> most of them, the new ones won't know about me. Oh well, that, so <laughs> that, that'll help us, right? So give me a chance to sneak up behind them and hit them the Yeah. Head. So great. Also on on a second another note. Uh, yesterday, we had our, our uh, corporate pilots meeting at Centennial. We had a very distinguished guest, uh, Mr. Lane, showed up there and, and gave, gave everybody uh, some you know charts and stuff. Remember, I was going to get one of the rolled up these. So what, got I plenty for before they only get yeah. this. Anyway, that's, that's pretty much it. <laughs> that's great. Hopefully, the next uh, couple of weeks will go smoothly and we won't have any. So, all right. I'm not going to when you say yeah, that. Right? Well, yeah, and Mark, well, after this is over, maybe you and I can mm -hmm. catch up. I, I will make one comment with uh, with all the shifting and changes in leadership at the FAA. I think one of the risks that the program faces is that uh, when they do go knock on some of those doors, that uh, new new folks will be a little conservative in their decision making. So yeah. uh, that may present some delays or some they're going to read every, part, part they're going to read every page in other they, words they are, yes. yeah and I, I will point out that the president's fy 23 budget does include 11 million dollars for remote towers uh, specifically ours and the one in Leesburg. so that's good news to see that yeah some interest in funding that which here to four has not been in that kind of legislation so that's good well good way to keep the cats herded there We'll get her done. I'm sure that's working out. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Bill. You're um, welcome, Pardon? You're welcome. You're thank well, you thank you. Much. Thanks, Bill. Appreciate oh, no, thank you. <laughs> uh, so let's go to the next item 11 uh, legislative issues of uh, the updated uh, 2022 advocacy resolution 2022 4. That, Mr. Chair, throw this uh, out. you'll all recall at your February 1st meeting, you adopted your annual 2022 advocacy resolution, which outlines your position on a variety of legislative and policy issues that affect aviation in Colorado. Um, literally that day, um, House Bill 22-1109 was introduced, and that would expand the state's existing uh, sales and use tax exemption on scheduled air carrier aircraft. Uh, to on-demand and charter aircraft. Uh, and that bill was, was shepherded by Colorado Aviation Business Association uh, and introduced to their, uh, their leadership. Uh, at the time, we didn't really have a good understanding of the bill and the political optics, especially with the governor's office. We all report to the governor, as we all do. So we needed to learn a little bit more and it was not included, a uh, position on that was not included at that moment in time. Uh, since then, we've gotten a clear vision that it's got very strong support. Um, as of last week, it continues the process. It was introduced uh, in the House. It was referred to the Business Affairs and Labor Committee on February 17th. It passed out a 12-0 vote. So it's got at least uh, so far a strong bipartisan support. Um, it did include, I will point out, one of the challenges we had with the initially introduced bill uh, was that it um, said that the aeronautics division would provide information to the state auditor on the efficacy of the bill. Well, we don't process aircraft sales and use tax, uh, so I couldn't have had anything to share with them. That's the Department of Revenue. We got that fixed in that committee, um, and so that vote did include a, a, an amendment to have 
the DOR folks, not us, provide that info. Um, on March 3rd, the House Committee on Finance voted 11 0 to refer it to the House Appropriations Committee, where it's waiting scheduled for a current review. So uh, at that point, we would suggest, uh, as you see in there, adding language in that would uh, put the CAB support behind that piece of state legislation. So that's uh, uh, the one amendment that we have from uh, at least from staff's perspective, Mr. Chair, for that. Okay. Um, is it, is it, can we add to this? Any, anything, any Absolutely. other initiatives? No, if there's anything else we need to Is there do, anything is, else we would uh, like to add? Also, you might have an idea. Yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So as, as I mentioned earlier, um, in, the, in the meeting, the industry um, has formed a, 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 a collective organization, the Eagle, to go look at unleaded fuel and uh, an unleaded fuel issue. And of course, you know, that's a, that's a big deal to general aviation, you know, for those that aren't aware, the challenge here is that 20% um, uh, of the aircraft that um, that burn uh, unleaded fuel, that piston-driven aircraft that, that burn uh, leaded fuel, um, buy 80% of the of the fuel, um, and there's challenges in certifying uh, high-performance, uh, high-compression engines to use unleaded. So, um, and then there's a lot of challenges in the supply chain and how do you introduce new fuel um, in, into, the, into the network. And so um, on the flip side, um, as we talked about in the February meeting, EPA um, on January 12th announced that they were gonna go study, restudy the uh, leaded fuel issue in, in aviation. And um, with the possibility that there'll be a, a, a uh, finding what, what they would consider to be a um, an environmental endangerment finding in 2023. And so that's going to put pressure on the speed at which this all gets done. Um, the Eagle program and the goal of the industry is to have unleaded fuel by 2030, and that's not going to probably match uh, with what the industry's uh, ability to, uh, to move this through. So it's going to get a lot of public um, view. And, and so along with our uh, advocacy uh, around uh, carbon neutrality by 2050 and use of um, alternative fuels, you know, I think this, the unleaded issue fits in there. And so my suggestion is that we add another, uh, another bullet or another uh, item. I'm just going to read, this is not the words, but something to the effect that the board supports the aviation industry's efforts and actions to develop and implement a suitable, cost-effective, unleaded replacement fuel for the 100 octane low lead fuel currently being used in piston-powered aircraft. And in piston-powered aircraft, it's all aircrafts. Yeah. Um, I believe that's really important to the state. Um, it's really important to our constituency. It's certainly important to airports that sell fuel. Um, and so I think that's my that's my recommendation. Yeah, and I think that complements you know, the SAF aspect too on the other side. So uh, for consistency um, from, this, from the aeronautical board, I think that's a great idea. So um, anything else, do you, yeah. is there any other ideas or any other comments? Okay, well then let's, let's do a motion to approve an updated 2022 uh, Car Aeronautical Board Advocacy Resolution of 2022-04. I would move to update that with words similar to yours. Or if not exactly the same. To include. To include. Agreed. I'll uh, second. Okay. Uh, discussion? Any other discussion? Okay. With that, uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Can't aye. Okay. Great. Unanimous. Uh, okay. There we go. Got your Mr. resolution. Chair, I'll work with you to finalize the language yep. on that. We'll get that out and get your signature. And I'll share that with all of you. Do you want to email that? I, I said, you already did. Okay, I said, okay. So we'll get that right resolved and <laughs> included in there. So thanks. thanks. Nice job. Very nice. Okay. Um, with that, let's look at our proposed calendar. We got June uh, 8th, uh, the uh, spring CAOA conference in Grand Junction. So I hope everybody's excited. It's the big big conference, big spring conference. Mm -hmm. Last year it was a Telluride. Of course, Western Slope continues to shine and hosting it in Grand Junction. So I'm very I, proud of that. I heard that there's a limo service. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll need to work on the transportation, but uh, yeah. Okay. 
but uh, I think that's uh, looking really good and, and solid. And Mike talked a little bit about that. Um, and then on uh, June 9th is the uh, general meeting. Oh, that's part of the conference. Sorry about that. And then you have, and, that, and I think all the board members, uh, if you are going to the aeronautical board meeting, and I think the general meeting is, yeah, it's, it's, it's on the same day. So, so that it's really just a good experience and you're like, you didn't tell you right. Everybody's um, interacting, networking with our fellow aviation professionals, especially in the airport management world. So um, I think it'll be great for, hopefully we get a full staff and we'll get our uh, new board members on board as well. So, um, and then on August 30th, uh, we have the workshop that you're working on Dave for the uh, uh, staff workshop. That's an all-day event, and it will be here at the division offices. And then on the 31st, we would have our general meeting, so kind of like what we did last year. And I think everybody seemed to – that was pretty re good reception on that. So um, anybody else have anything else, or do you want to schedule any additional meetings or anything like that? That's it. No? Okay. <laughs> all right. Um, let's go to uh, the 13th. Or number 13, uh, other matters by the public and members. Um, does anybody else have any other issues, any new business, any new ideas, any interesting facts? Um, anybody on? Yes. Interesting fact. Yes, Dave. The meeting that they had with the Falcon Aerolabs, uh, yeah. Jim Stewart is our EAA president, and I met with Mark Hyatt and Sarah Hurley, their DO, okay. last week. And we're going to make an effort to try and get their base of operations out to the airport instead of the modular that they were in. Okay. He mentioned in that thing, they have 620 kids signed up next year at 20 locations around the state. Oh, that's fantastic. I don't know what kind of recruiting they're doing, but that's just phenomenal. Yeah, that's outstanding. That's great. A Good. lot of our scholarship applications come from Falcon Aero yeah. Lab. Yeah. Yes. That's great. Mm -hmm. Good. That's fantastic. Thank you. That's a nice update. Um, anybody else uh, on, online have questions? Chronophil again? Yes, Chair Mampa and the cab. Uh, I neglected earlier when I was doing my presentation uh, as I rushed through it to uh, mention that the airfield marking uh, professional certification program that we're doing in Colorado Springs uh, is being paid for primarily by a generous grant from the Division of Aeronautics. So I just wanted to take this opportunity to, to thank you guys for the support of that important educational program. Excellent. That's great. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. And I think it's a pleasure for us to provide that. And um, I think for most people, uh, um, it's it sounds kind of common sense, but I think it's really important that um, markings are can be have become increasingly more and more complex. And whenever we have our certain specters, or especially uh, even you know at big airports, uh, general aviation airports, or what have you. Um, there can be some confusion. Um, and you're trying to meet the latest standards uh, with the advisory circulars, but also um, you know, working with the contractors and having expertise and doing training courses like this, it's a tremendous help to help with that. And, you know, I always say, I like to joke that you can take an average pilot and show them you know, anything outside the whole line, they get real confused real fast. So, so uh, for consistency and sometimes um, airports like to get creative and add their own markings you know, different colors or what have you. And a lot of that is, uh, can be uh, improved through those uh, opportunities in education. So thanks, Mike. Great, nice work. Thank you. Okay. Um, anything else? I, I One thing, and sorry to hit you out of the blue, but this was actually recommended to me a while ago from one of our previous chairs, uh, Mr. Ray Beck. Um, and he had asked, do we have uh, resources available to set up a flagpole and a spotlight outside of this building? I would say, yes, we would. Do you think we could maybe work on something like that? I mean, since the state patrol is here as well, but sure. well, it would be nice to have an outdoor absolutely flag. I think I, I keep forgetting to talk to you about that. Since so. we're on airport, we'll probably have to do a part 77 determination. Yes, <laughs> yes, exactly. So make sure it's a couple hundred feet tall. <laughs> Yeah, we'll get with, uh, I we'll mean, our landlord. Yeah, I want one of those. Uh, car, I want one of those car dealership flags. Those monsters. We will absolutely. Okay. You could do that right in the middle of your airport. Yeah. How's that, Jeff? 
absolutely follow up on your request. Okay. Nothing says America. Like <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, with that, uh, if no one has anything else, I think we can call ourselves adjourned. And uh, thank you for everybody for your time and and uh, nice job with the uh, staff. And uh, thanks for coming. Thank you. With our limited numbers that we have. <laughs> so. I miss Kent. Yeah. I do. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, we got to get you next round, right? We'll see you in June. Ne next time for sure. He said next time for sure. Okay, good. Good deal. All right. Thanks. Thank you, guys.